Back in the summer of 2020, I decided to call up my grandfather and document a conversation I'd been meaning to have with him for years. What, what kind of machine do you have there? It's just on my computer. It records the audio so that I can play it back later. <laughs> okay, what do you want to know? This is my grandfather, Norbert. I just called him Saba, Hebrew for grandfather. He was now in his 90s, and his COVID ran rampant, and my grandparents' assisted living facility was once again put on strict lockdown. It wasn't lost on me that I could be quickly running out of time to speak with him. And if I kept putting it off, his story might be lost forever. A story which, as I watched political divisions and extremism in my own country grow, seemed more and more relevant every day. I'd been meaning to talk to him for years about how our family ended up in America. I'd interviewed him for a project in middle school, but back then I'd heard a very sanitized version of the story, mostly about the boat trip over and getting settled into his new life. I'd heard bits and pieces from my mom and my aunts over the years about an arrestor in Kristallnacht and a lost sister, but never the details, so I decided to find out the whole story. He'd come to the U.S. from Vienna as a young boy in the winter of 1939, a newly stateless citizen of Germany, as conditions were rapidly worsening for Jewish people like him. My grandfather was already in America by the time World War II officially started, but his family had seen the build-up to it. They had seen the changes taking hold of their government and countrymen, first in minor incidents and little comments that could be shrugged off as not that big a deal. But left unchecked, those little changes built up until they created a momentum that couldn't be stopped. And when things finally reached the tipping point, life changed so quickly that for many, it was too late. Hello, I'm Alana Weitz, and this is Culture Jumpers, stories about making the jump from one cultural context to another. This week, on April 18th, many around the world mark Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day. It's a day to remember those who died, to reflect on how such a tragedy could happen, and to reaffirm our commitment to never forget, to never let it happen again. But never again, what does that mean exactly? What are the warning signs that it's starting to happen in the first place? And can you stop something if you don't recognize it for what it is? Start from the beginning. I found a record that says that your parents were originally from Poland. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. How did they end up in Austria? From what I understand, they came uh, to to Vienna uh, right after the uh, first war, or or a little before the war, and settled in the, in Vienna. Uh, my father came from a little town called uh, Topolov. And my mother came from a little town called Stoyanov. That's all I know. My great-grandparents were married in Toporov in 1912 and had their first child later that year. Today, Toporov is in Ukraine, but at the time it was part of Poland and under control of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Between the mid-1800s and World War I, the area saw regular skirmishes as the Russian, German, and Austro-Hungarian empires fought for control of the region. Do you know why they decided on Vienna? Well, uh, it was a, a place where, for Jews uh, who wanted to leave Poland for whatever reason. Maybe the, the economy was not so good, so they wanted to make a change, and they came to Vienna. In addition to the political instability, opportunities for the area's Jewish population were limited. Vienna, by contrast, had developed into a cultural hub for Jewish people a place where they could find opportunity and prosperity. It also appealed to my great-grandparents for another reason. Their daughter had suffered an accident as a baby that had left her unable to hear and speak, and Vienna had a cutting-edge school for the deaf. So they packed up and moved to Vienna to start a new life, and after having to serve in the army during World War I, my great-grandfather went into business. What kind of work did your dad do? He dealt in dry goods and... uh... Also make uh, pants and uh, jackets and things of that nature. But the hope for a better life in Austria was short-lived. Adolf Hitler was already a household name in neighboring Germany by the time Saba was born in 1928. 
The charismatic man from Austria climbed the ranks of the National Socialist Party through fiery rhetoric about reuniting Austria and Germany and restoring the German Empire to its former glory. Central to his platform was the conspiracy theory that Germany was undefeated on the battlefield in World War I, and that it had only surrendered because of backstabbing Jews in the German government. In 1923, Hitler led 2,000 Nazis in an attempt to overthrow the Bavarian Defense Ministry in what would become known as the Beer Hall Putsch. The coup attempt failed, and Hitler was arrested for treason, but the highly publicized trial only gave him a larger platform to spread his political views. During his brief nine months in prison, he worked on his memoir and manifesto Mein Kampf, which helped him recruit a diehard following once he was released. Then, in 1929, the economic impact of the Great Depression gave the Nazis the opening they had been waiting for. No longer confined to the margins of politics, they gained national popularity and power by appealing to financially suffering Germans. Because of his popularity, when the Nazi party gained control of the lower parliament in 1933, Hitler was their natural choice for chancellor. And although they didn't have enough seats to appoint him outright, they were able to persuade enough mainstream conservative lawmakers to support him. The decision would have dire consequences for Jews in Vienna just a few years later. When you were born, Hitler was already sort of coming to power, so did you ever know a time when it was like a good life for Jews, or was it always sort of hanging over you? Uh, I guess I did understand that there was a threat of the Germans, uh, even at that age. Did you feel things changing before Kristallnacht, or was that the first time that you realized that it was dangerous? Well, I, I, I knew that when the Germans invaded, that uh, things would be changing. They didn't like Jews. Uh, they used to march in the streets and uh, to the youth groups and, and shout and, and, and riot and, and, and wish the Jews Judefaveke, which means uh, the Jews should die. So uh, we understood that things were not so good when the Germans came in. Hitler assumed the role as Germany's top leader in 1934 after President von Hindenburg died while in office. He then put in place a series of sweeping legislative changes, establishing the Nazis as a dictatorship and setting the stage for Hitler to expand outside the country's borders. The Germans began exerting more and more pressure over Austria to unify with them as a greater Germanic state. Austrian Chancellor Kurt von Schuschnigg was no fan of Hitler's desire to take away Austria's autonomy. He tried an appeasement policy at first, but Hitler continued to make speeches alluding to uniting Germans outside his country's borders. In response, Schuschnigg addressed the Austrian parliament in a fiery speech against giving over control to Germany. I listened to the speech even when I was a kid, and uh, I remember the line that he said in German, Rot, Weiss, Rot, wir sind tot. Red, red, white, red until death. That's the flag of, of Austria. So I knew that things were not so hot, that uh, there was a lot of pressure on him to resign, and that's what happened. Unfortunately, many Austrians supported Hitler over Schuschnigg. Austria had been stripped of many of its territories after World War I and suffered economic collapse after the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1918 and again during the Great Depression. They saw Austrian-born Hitler as a native son who would unite ethnic Germans under one rule and bring back prosperity. In a last-ditch effort for control, on March 9, 1938, Schuschnigg announced a surprise vote for the Austrian people to determine the future of Austrian independence. Furious, Hitler responded with an ultimatum. If Austria didn't cancel the vote, and if Schuschnigg didn't resign, he would send in his troops. Seeing no other choice, Schuschnigg agreed to Hitler's demands, and Security Minister Arthur Seiss Inkvart was appointed as Chancellor of Austria. But the next morning, the Germans invaded anyway. Though it's more accurate to say the German troops were greeted with open arms by cheering Austrian crowds. The Germans have marched in overnight and they took over. And the flags flew with the, with the uh, cross, the Hakenkreuz, as they call it, the uh, swastika. And uh, the, the crowds were shouting, and, uh, and the Austrians accepted the Germans coming in as friends. 
and uh, what will to do about it. Along a dozen roads, the Iron Cross and the Eagle wave in the breeze. The shadow of the goose step falls on Austrian soil. While in Vienna, Austria's Nazi leader watches a gigantic parade from the balcony of the Chancellery. And in grass, Hitler himself drives into the city. This is the hour of his triumph, the hour when his dream of annexing Austria is realized. After a triumphant march through Vienna, Hitler and Seiss Inkfart signed the Anschluss Agreement, officially making Austria a German province. Austria did eventually hold the independence vote in April. The official result of the non-secret ballot was over 99% in favor of joining Germany, with over 99% voter turnout. And though these results were clearly rigged by the Nazis, historians conclude that the real number was likely still close to two-thirds in favor. And uh, that's when the problem started with the Jews. They took the Jews and they had them wash the sidewalks with uh, with lye, and, you know, that burnt their hands and so forth. They mistreated them even at that particular time. So Jews understood that uh, they had to leave. They didn't like them. Did your parents experience anything firsthand before your father was arrested? No, not not really. Although there were incidents that, uh, yes, yes, uh, there was one Friday night we were coming home from the synagogue, and uh, one of the drunks started to trail him, call him names and so forth. That particular time he had a beard. So anybody who had a beard, you know, he was really typed just like a Jew right by the way. And they didn't like Jews. And uh, I, as a kid, also experienced anti-Semitic uh, incidents. There was an amusement park in Vienna known as the Prata. And uh, I used to wear a, uh, a hat. And one of the boys came over to me and smashed the hat and threw it into one of the toilets there. <laughs> uh, I didn't know what to do to take it out, and didn't take it out. <laughs> but, but that was one of the incidents that I remember as a kid, what they used to do. So that's the way it was. With the Germans in control, Jews were losing hope that things would turn around. Later that summer, my great-grandfather Isaac sent his middle daughter, Erna, to live with his brother in the U.S. What's the age gap between you and Aunt Erna? Between me and Erna was seven years. Were you close with her growing up? Yes, uh, she took care of me when I was a kid. Was she already in America before you came? She left earlier, yes. I left in 1939. She left about six months before me. What was the reason that you decided to come to America? The reason was because the Jews tried to get out of Germany and Austria as fast as they could. And uh, my father uh, had a brother here, and he arranged uh, for, for my sister to come first. And then I came, and uh, then uh, my parents came. They were the last ones out, I understood. In fact, I think they left on Yom Kippur. Of 1939. So how did it work out that Aunt Erna came first? Well, I guess my father arranged that uh, she, should, she should leave, especially because she was a girl. You never knew what, what the Germans would do. So that was arranged. She left with a cousin of hers. They traveled together on the uh, Normandy, I understand. I came on the Queen Mary. Had your parents been planning to leave before Kristallnacht, or was that when they really started to try to get out? I don't know the timing of it, but after Kristallnacht, they uh, appealed to the brother, my father did, to see if we could get papers to come to the United States. At that time, he needed sponsors to come, and the sponsors were responsible. They had to uh, show their, their income and so forth that the uh, it would not become a burden to the uh, community, but they would become self-sustaining, and uh, people 
lined up in front of consulates in order to get passage to leave Austria. In 1938, about 192,000 Jews lived in Vienna, making up almost 10% of the city's population and 90% of the entire Jewish population in Austria. Almost 117,000 were able to leave Austria by 1940. Those who were lucky ended up in the Americas, Asia, and other places outside Hitler's grasp. But many of them settled in nearby European countries, where they would be caught up in the war anyway. By late 1941, Jews were prohibited from emigrating from German-occupied lands. Instead, the Nazis began mass deportations of Jews to ghettos and concentration camps. Between those who couldn't leave and those who couldn't get far enough away, 65,000 Austrian Jews ultimately died in the Holocaust. Though there were rumblings of things to come even before Austria's annexation, and many Jews had left after conditions worsened with the German invasion, November 1938 marked a turning point. On November 7th, a Jewish man from Poland walked into the German embassy in Paris and shot a diplomat. The diplomat died two days later. Incidentally, Hitler and his crew were at a dinner celebrating the anniversary of the Beer Hall Putsch when they got word. The shooting became a rallying cry and the official excuse for retaliation against Jews. The German government quickly began stripping away the rights of Jewish citizens, prohibiting them from gathering for cultural activities, attending state schools, and publishing newspapers. Top Nazi leaders encouraged riots, arrests, and confiscation of Jewish property across Germany. And on the night of November 9th, Jews would receive the message loud and clear that they were no longer welcome. This night would come to be known as Kristallnacht. Did you understand what was happening at the time? Of course I understood. I was, uh, I was 10, 10 and a half at that time. I knew what was going on. Uh, I was there the, the, the 9th of November to the 10th of November, and uh, got up in the morning, we got to school, and my school was on fire. They had uh, rioted the whole night, and burned down all the synagogues and uh, smashed all the windows. That's why they call it Kristallnacht, the crystal night. They broke the windows of places, and it was a whole pogrom. Of course, of course, I realized that. They arrested my father. Did they just come to the door and drag him out? Well, what happened was, uh, to my recollection, they came up, uh, a guy dressed in a... Uh, leather jacket. He was one of the, uh, I don't know what he was. And he asked for, for my father. My father happened to be sitting in one of the rooms in the apartment that we lived in. And my mother must have told him that he wasn't home. So they started looking, searching. And they saw him sitting in the, in the room, in the, in the apartment. So uh, they dragged him out. And uh, as I remember, he slapped my mother that uh, she had a swollen cheek for a, a couple of weeks, uh, so hard. Uh, and then they put him on a wagon and they dragged him away with a number of other people who lived in the apartment where we lived. They took him to a police station, and uh, I stood outside of the police station, but they were taking people into the station and then sending him out to another building across the street. And uh, those who went across the street they went to the concentration camp, I understand. And the ones that they released came out. And I must have been standing next to my mother at the time and said things would be okay, that they would come back. And that's what happened. They let him go. My father was let go because he was a Polish citizen, so they didn't uh, bother with Polish citizens at that particular time. Did your father talk about what happened? He must have talked about it, but I don't remember what he said. So you don't know what they asked him? No, I have no idea. Did he seem scared when he came out? <laughs> he wasn't very happy. My family was luckier than most. 
Having already gotten his daughter out of Vienna, my great-grandfather Isaac redoubled his efforts to get his family to safety after his brush with death on Kristallnacht. Traveling with another family who lived in their building, Saba arrived in the U.S. in February 1939. By September of that year, my great-grandparents were finally able to escape to Holland and joined him soon after. But even the lucky few didn't escape unscathed. Remember, Saba was the youngest of three children. The oldest daughter, Sora, was in her mid-twenties. She was already married and living on her own in Austria, which meant she had to apply separately to leave. And though her father Isaac tried his hardest to save her, she would prove to be just out of reach. Unfortunately, she was left behind with a husband and a child and perished in the Holocaust. We tried to get her out, but it was too late. She almost had the immigration papers to come to the United States, but then the war started, and um, there was no more possibility to bring her over. In fact, my father even had arranged the fare for her passage on a boat, and uh, I went through some of the stuff the other day, and I found that uh, the ship, uh, shipping company returned the, the money that was given as a deposit, but it was too late to bring her out. And we were in Vienna a number of years ago, and I started looking and found out that she was deported on a certain date to a certain town, and there's a record of that. But uh, she never came out of it. That's the loss. to know for sure what happened to Saba's sister, so I did some digging. I knew that the Yad Vashem Museum was my best shot. Yad Vashem in Jerusalem has one of the most extensive Holocaust archives in the world, with a mission to catalog as many victims' records as possible for the purpose of remembrance and education. Many of those records are available online. It was honestly a little shocking how easy it was to find. With a few clicks, I knew the train she was on, the date of her deportation, even her prisoner number. Just like that, my family's fate was laid out on my computer screen. My great-aunt Sora was deported from Vienna by train in May of 1942, along with her husband, their one-year-old son, and her husband's parents. They arrived in Izbica, Poland, a ghetto that acted as a transfer point before Jews were either shot or sent to the Belchik extermination camp. There had been 1,000 people on the train with my great-aunt. It was one of four trains departing from Vienna between April and June that year, carrying 4,000 Jews to Poland. None of them survived the Holocaust. What was interesting about speaking with my grandfather was his sense of duality. He talked about knowing that things were worsening and how they knew they had to leave, but he also said he enjoyed his childhood. When I asked if the teachers at his Jewish day school talked about what was happening, he said no one addressed it. When I asked if he or his family had directly faced anti-Semitic treatment, at first he said no. It was only after thinking about it that he recalled those traumatic incidents. Now granted, it's been over 80 years, but it wasn't just the struggle to remember. It's that both of these realities were true. Life went on pretty normally at first. And it's amazing how subtly things can change in the beginning. How normal life feels before the rug is pulled out from under you. It starts as a few slurs, maybe some bullying here and there. But you come out unhurt, so it's easy to dismiss. You shrug it off, and you keep going to school and living your life. Until one day, the neighbors force you to scrub the streets. Or you wake up to find your school on fire. Or someone bangs on the door and rips your loved one away from you. The phrase never again was meant as a warning for the world to stay vigilant to prevent future holocausts. But recently, never again has taken on a new meaning to me. 
In a few short years, there won't be anyone left alive who witnessed the Holocaust. Never again will they be able to tell their stories, to impart their wisdom and warnings. And as legislators here in the United States pass laws banning books and discussions with uncomfortable subjects, including the Holocaust, the next generation may never learn about it at all. And that's why we must continue telling their stories after they're gone. Because if they're forgotten, we risk losing the lessons learned from the Holocaust. Like the dangers of following charismatic leaders who peddle conspiracy theories and vague promises about restoring the country to some mythical form or glory. The dangers of not standing up to protect marginalized groups who are singled out as the source of all of our problems because we're not personally affected by their mistreatment. The danger of naively believing that it can't happen here. That it can never happen again. Today's episode of Culture Jumpers was written by me, Alana Weitz, and edited by myself and Lionel Nicolau. Music and sound design were by me, with additional sound editing by Lionel. Special thanks for this episode go to my grandfather, who passed away in November 2021 at the age of 93. And special thanks go to you for listening and ensuring his story won't be forgotten. We'll see you next time.